Jeffrey Snover, uh, uh, and I also am the lead architect over the Enterprise Cloud Group. There I oversee the technologies that many of you use in your data centers today. So that's Windows Server, System Center, Operations Management Suite, and next year it will be the Microsoft Azure Stack. So there's a ton of enthusiasm about the cloud these days, isn't there? I mean, you just can't swing a cat without finding some vendor wanting to talk to you about the cloud. But often these conversations are about taking you to the cloud, taking you to the cloud. Today, I'm going to talk about how the cloud, we can take the cloud to you and to your data centers. So what we see is that there's a lot of, uh, you know, businesses accelerating. It's moving fast and accelerating, right? And what we're finding is that customers, uh, businesses, need to respond to their competitors in real time. They see an opportunity, they got to grab it immediately. And what this is doing is it's placing a lot of demands on the IT shop, right? Um, the IT shop, however, it's strained, right? IT, we like to be stable. We like to have no drama. We like to be predictable and, uh, and, and again, no drama. Now, the challenge here is that uh, there's this tension between the two. So there's a great story about how when Azure started, uh, one of the big early wins was a large auto manufacturing uh, uh, marketing department who went to their IT organization and said, hey, we want to have this campaign. Uh, can you produce this application for us? And the IT department said, no, right? IT, we're the guys that put no in innovation. Uh, so they said, no, you know, we can't meet, we can't meet that schedule. Well, the IT department said, well, you know, the heck with you, I've got a budget, and uh, we're going to go talk to these contractors, and they threw some money at some contractors. Those contractors used Azure, and in very short order, they were put together a very, very successful marketing campaign for this manufacturer. So that was fantastic. You know, it was used as an early Azure um, win story. But when I looked at that story, I thought to myself, hey, wait a second. That ad campaign is collecting customer information. Is that customer information being protected properly? Corporations need to have, have security controls. Did that contractor know what those security controls are and did they implement those? No, I don't know the answer, I didn't follow up, but my guess is that they aren't. My guess is that it was left to the IT organization to go clean up the mess that this contractor had built. And here's the phenomenon I wanna talk about. Businesses must be effective, and it's good to be efficient. They must be effective. They had an opportunity, they needed to go grab it, and when IT wasn't able to meet their needs, they went and threw money at contractors and did something in the cloud. This is what we call shadow IT. This creates a mess, because often those things are not done to corporate standards, and then IT has to go clean that up. In fact, if you look at the history of IT, in fact, the history of IT has always been the post facto cleanup of the mess that some business organization went and made. So what we want to do is we want to avoid that going forward. We believe that by IT adopting a cloud service delivery model, IT can have the stability and predictability it needs while delivering the agility and flexibilities that businesses demand. Now, there's a lot of talk about the cloud, cloud this, cloud that. But when you actually go and try and drill into it and say, well, what should I do with this? You'll find that there are a lot of concerns, right? What about performance? Is it actually gonna be able to meet my needs? I see these advertised numbers. What do those advertised numbers really mean? Are those like sunny day numbers? Or are those rainy day numbers? Am I gonna have variations? If I have an application that's dependent upon low latency, can I get that? What about data sovereignty? If I store my data and I'm gonna be sure that it goes where it's supposed to go and then doesn't go anywhere from there. There are issues around security. Does it really secure, et cetera, as well as am I part of a regulated industry? And does it meet the, the regulations that I must uh, adhere to? So as people go and do the technical due diligence on these various points, a lot of people come to the conclusion that the correct solution is a hybrid solution. So the question then is, well, what does hybrid really mean? And there's a lot of answers to this. Some people view hybrid as the lift and shift model. I've got an on-premises on server, 
I take its workload and I just buy a, a cloud server and I run it there, it's the exact same thing. That's one approach. Another approach is to say, well, I'm gonna take the existing applications that I have, I'll leave them as is, but then new development will be done in the cloud. Other people try and broker clouds. Oh, I'll, I'll have this lowest common denominator services, and then I'll be able to use this cloud vendor or that cloud vendor or that cloud vendor. Other people see, oh, I can take advantage of a service offering from the cloud to provide me services to my on-premise data center. So there's lots of different nuances and approaches to this hybrid cloud. There's lots of chaos and confusion when talking about the hybrid cloud. Now my background, my background is in physics. I studied physics in college. And in physics, whenever there's chaos or confusion, you always go back to first principles. Okay, so let's go back to the first principles here. What is it that we're trying to solve for? I mentioned to you, businesses must be effective. That's what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to make it so that businesses can innovate and compete effectively. So what's that all about? That's about the applications themselves. We want to be able to deliver applications fast, deliver them effectively, deliver them reliably. We need to empower our developers to produce those applications by giving them the substrate, the agile substrate, where they can do their best work on our platform. We need to be able to deliver these new services in a fast, reliable manner. Okay, so it's about innovation. But I mentioned that you have to be effective and you want to be efficient as well. So what you want to do is you want to be able to invest in competitive differentiators and you want to be able to reduce capital expenditures. Now Jeffrey Moore wrote the famous book Crossing the Chasm and he has this wonderful model about core versus context activities. Core activities are those activities you invest in to gain a competitive differentiation. Context activities are those things that you have to do to run a business, but that don't lead to competitive differentiation. So for instance, Microsoft. Microsoft, our core business is software. So we go find some of the world's best talent to run and write our software. However, we also have to have cafeterias, we have shuttles, we have receptionists. And there, we try and outsource as much as that as possible. That's a context activity. You'll notice we have no technical fellow of the cafeterias, right? That's just not something we want to invest in. So what you want to do is you want to invest in making differences that make differences, okay? So you want to be efficient, but you want to be effective. And you also want to be flexible. You want to be able to choose where and when to deploy particular workloads and you want to decrease the risk of vendor lock-in. So let's talk about this vendor lock-in because it comes up in almost every conversation I have with a customer. Let me be clear, at the end of the day, you're gonna to need to invest in a partner ecosystem, in a cloud ecosystem. And the question is, well, which cloud ecosystem to invest in? Which one's gonna give you the best return and which one allows you to focus in on your business, okay? Now with that, um, you know, how far do you go with vendor lock-in? Like, are you really concerned about using Intel CPUs? Right, because that's a vendor lock-in. And if you're concerned about that, you can get an ARM license. You can extend that to produce your own CPUs and you can go to Cloud Foundry and, and you can generate your own CPUs. Not too many people are doing that today. So most people are comfortable with that partner ecosystem. So too, there are do-it-yourself clouds. Lots of great do-it-yourself cloud initiatives. But the question is, is that where you want to invest? Alternatively, there are three big companies, three cloud ecosystems that are spending you know, multi-billion dollars a year, and those allow you to take advantage of those cloud ecosystems and then focus on higher level business abstractions. So there's basically these two approaches to the data center. There's the traditional approach and the emerging cloud model. The DevOps community calls this the world of pets and the world of cattle. The world of pets, each 
server is a precious thing. Uh, it's what they sometimes call a snowflake server. You have high-end, gold-plated hardware that you spend a lot of attention to. You know, it's like a pet. You know, it's, a, it's a something you care about. You, you, it's tender. If something's, you know, you give it a name, you know, Fluffy, uh, and if it get, something goes wrong, if it gets sick, you take it to a vet. There's a lot of drama associated with problems in that. In the world of cattle, you don't give cattle names. You give cattle numbers. And when they get sick, you don't call a vet, you fire up the barbecue, okay? That's the world of the cloud, right? There's no drama here. You know, you're not buying gold-plated hardware. You're buying a, a bunch of exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. Value-added hardware. But then you leverage the magic of software to then produce these higher order abstractions, where if any individual component goes by, it's not a drama, it's just another thing that happens. And with the correct architectures and design principles, these, these problems, these outages of individual components do not translate into business outages. So those are the two models. The cloud is not a place. The cloud is not a place. The cloud is an architecture. So if you take a look at Microsoft's data centers, they look a lot like your data centers. They have rows of racks of computers. The big difference between our data centers and other people's data centers is that our data centers are absolutely homogeneous. It's the same hardware over and over again. And that gives us this flexible substrate to be able to use our software to produce one of the largest public clouds in the world. On top of that infrastructure, we build infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, service offerings. We have a portal that allows tenants to consume and self-provision these things without intervention by the people running the fabric. The consumer, the tenant themselves, walks up to this and says, oh, I'd like a little bit of this and I'd like a little bit of that, and they're provisioned for that. These services are offered through protocols often REST APIs, and because they're offered through protocols and REST APIs, they're available by any workload, which is to say Windows or Linux can equally consume these APIs and protocols. So it's a wonderful world. Now, there's a lot of talk about the cloud, a lot of talk about the cloud, and you will hear uh, there's a lot of opinions about the cloud. There are a lot of people who will tell you Here's how you should go to the cloud. Here's what you must do. And I don't know about you, but when I hear these people, I kind of step back and I say, who are these people? And what experience do they have that informs their opinion? And how much should I weigh their opinion? So let me tell you a little bit about our experience. This is the Microsoft world, right? The Microsoft Azure world. Microsoft Azure has 24 regional data centers across the world. In these 24 regional data centers, we have multiple in regions, we have multiple data centers. We run over 100 data centers in these regions. We have one of the, one of the top three networks in the world. Microsoft spends over $10 billion a year in research and development, all up, and in the last few years, we've spent over $15 billion building out some of these data centers. Last year alone, we, we rolled out over 500 new features and services in Azure. It's one of the side effects of investing over $10 billion a year in RD. Turns out you get a little bit for your money. Now, what makes Microsoft unique in the, in the ecosystem or in the, in the industry is that we are taking our learnings running data centers at the scale, and we're making it available to you so you can do this on your data centers. What we're doing is we're combining the power of Azure with the control of your own data center. So here we have Azure, we have its cloud infrastructure, its infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, it's PaaS as a service, platform as a service, and a portal offering applications to, uh, services to both Unix and Linux applications. And then we have the private cloud today, right? We have on-premise data center assets serving both Linux and Unix. 
What we're going to do is we're going to take the Azure technology, the Azure cloud infrastructure, the Azure infrastructure as service and platform as a service services, as well as the portal, and we'll be bringing those to the private cloud. We're going to call that the Microsoft Azure Stack. Again, we take the Azure technologies to give you virtualized compute. Uh, the exact same, we, look, in the next version of Windows Server, we're going to be releasing the first, first time a software load balancer. So you might say to yourself, oh, version one of a software load balancer. Should I really bet on that? You know, version one, I'm not so sure about that. Well, my friends, this is exactly the same code that's been running in Azure for a number of years now. So this is not like a version one that you're familiar with. This is exactly the same code. So the code there for networking, storage, compute, and security that we use to run our Azure, we're going to be making available on-premises. Now, you'll be able to run that on your data centers, and hosters will be picking this up, and they'll be running it on their data centers. So if you want to, you can do it yourself, or you can take advantage of this from a trusted supplier. Now, Veeam has been a fantastic partner with Microsoft throughout our data center journey. When we're in the traditional data center, Veeam had great backup products or has great backup products, uh, lots of customer success. Customers love these products, obviously. You're here, you love these products. But as we make our journey to the cloud, Veeam continues to be a fantastic partner. One of our customers, uh, common customers, Geotrim, um, used Veeam backup and recovery and was able to achieve fantastic results reducing their backup time by over, over 75 percent as well as reducing their restore time. Now having been comfortable with that, having taken that uh, care of, they were then able to shift their focus and think about the next order of concerns. Hey, what about a catastrophic uh, problem? What would we do if there was a catastrophic problem? And so what they did was they took advantage of Veeam's uh, Veeam Cloud Connect to now be able to back up their data from on-premises data center to the Azure cloud. So if something goes wrong with their data center, their data, the heart of the business, the stuff that runs their business is always protected. And they were very successful. Now this partner, Geotrim, worked with a partner, um, a, uh, uh, um, on, on Rego. Sorry, pronounced that incorrectly. But anyway, that's a Veeam Pro partner, and they're also a Microsoft Circle partner, Microsoft Azure Circle partner, and they partnered with them to deploy that solution, and they're very successful. In fact, Veeam's Cloud Connect is one of the most popular downloads from the Microsoft Azure Gallery. So there's a fantastic partnership here. Now, going forward, what I encourage you to do is to come to our sessions. Later on today, I'll be giving a talk about Nano Server. Nano Server is the refactoring of Windows Server, and it is one of the most revolutionary things we've ever done. It is 20 times smaller than Server with a GUI. 20 times smaller. Pretty crazy stuff. So come to my talk. You'll see that. Also, Ben Armstrong, the virtual PC guy, is going to be uh, talking about top investments in the next release of Hypervisor. And we've got a nice big booth here. I saw a bunch of you there uh, last night. Please, if you haven't made it over, come over, ask some questions, see what we're doing. And then I want you to download and try the Veeam uh, Backup Cloud Connect, uh, as well as their management pack for System Center. Lastly, I encourage you to download and try the new Windows Server 2016 uh, technical preview. Windows Server, Windows Server 20, 2016 is uh, a substantial release. In fact, it's one of the most important releases we've ever had. Windows Server 2016 lays the architectural foundations for the next 20 years of Windows Server and Windows application development. Things like Nano Server, containers, uh, a new installation model that is purely declarative, uh, unit testing, des desired state configuration. So it's amazing stuff. I encourage you to download it, kick the tires, let us know how it works for you, and uh, thank you, and we hope to see you on the journey to the cloud. Thank you.